Welcome back to Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers, the podcast devoted to exploring the frontiers of psychedelic medicine and what it takes to cultivate a healthy mind, body, and spirit. I'm Dr. Steve Thayer, and today my co-host, Dr. Reed Robison, and I are joined again by Hannah Cross. For those of you who might be new to the show, Hannah is a regular guest and as a licensed clinical social worker, excellent therapist, Reiki master, yoga teacher, ecstatic dance facilitator, and an expert at using psychedelic medicines to enhance the psychotherapy process. Today on the show, we share our own personal experiences of being on the other side of the therapy couch, so to speak. Like many therapists, Reed, Hannah, and I have benefited tremendously from receiving our own therapy and coaching over the years. We discuss some of these experiences in an effort to normalize seeking help, especially for those of you who are in or aspire to be in the helping profession. I also wanted to take a second here and thank all of you who have left reviews, rated the show, or shared the show with your friends. Our listenership is steadily growing, and it's all thanks to you. So if you haven't already, please rate, review, and share the show. Now I bring you Hannah Cross. A poem by Jack Gilbert entitled, A Brief for the Defense. Sorrow everywhere, slaughter everywhere. If babies are not starving someplace, they're starving somewhere else, with flies in their nostrils. But we enjoy our lives because that's what God wants. Otherwise, the mornings before summer dawn would not be made so fine. The Bengal tiger would not be fashioned so miraculously well. The poor women at the fountain are laughing together between the suffering they have known and the awfulness in their future, smiling and laughing while somebody in the village is very sick. There is laughter every day in the terrible streets of Calcutta, and the women laugh in the cages of Bombay. If we deny our happiness, resist our satisfaction, we lessen the importance of their deprivation. Mm. We must risk delight. We can do without pleasure, but not delight not enjoyment. We must have the stubbornness to accept our gladness in the ruthless furnace of this world. To make injustice, the only measure of our attention is to praise the devil. If the locomotive of the Lord runs us down, we should give thanks that the end had magnitude. We must admit there will be music despite everything. We stand at the prow again of a small ship anchored late at night in the tiny port looking over the sleeping island. The waterfront is three shuttered cafes and one naked light burning. To hear the faint sound of oars in the silence as a rowboat comes slowly out and then goes back is truly worth all the years of sorrow that are to come. That's melancholic, Steve. It is. So I heard Jack Cornfield read this poem on Tim Ferriss's latest interview with him. I was driving home, listening to podcasts as I do. And uh, it hit me in the feels. The idea that, that you know, and because I have a lot of my a lot of my clients will will talk about the state of the world, mm-hmm. and um, how they feel like to be happy is sort of a betrayal of the state of things. Mm-hmm. And people whose lives are, by most measurements, pretty good. They have safety. They have food. They have running water. They have medical care. They have friends. They have family. They have their health to a certain degree still struggle to be happy Mm -hmm. and there's the whole like finish the plate of food they're starving children of africa vibe in a lot of our heads that um prevent us from surrendering to what i I mean i'm not a a pro poem reader or understander but Mm -hmm. i think to the message a, a brief in defense of of allowing yourself to feel joy to feel delight um because to do so is a kind of betrayal in and of itself to feel joy and delight in spite of it all, along with it all. Because of it all. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. of it all. Yeah. So um, this poem, not necessarily direct, directly related to the topic we discussed covering today, but it just struck me and I wanted to share it with our audience. We might find a way to weave it in. What was the context that Jack um, brought it up in? Do you remember? Uh, Tim was talking about how discouraged he had been feeling that Mm, he had been getting a lot of feedback from his audience of millions and millions of listeners that there was a lot of despair, people kind of feeling jaded, Mm -hmm. giving up, uh, feeling hopeless. And so Tim was sort of transmitting that feeling to Jack and, uh, that's the poem that he read very apropos. 
This this morning, you know, we we were training clinicians in CAP, mm -hmm. ketamine assisted psychotherapy, and in my group, um, one of the therapists remarked how um, she had heard so many times in the last week or two. Uh, people mention their uh, stress around the recession, like mm -hmm. talking about this recession. And yeah, I was thinking about um, what's alive right now in all of us, this collective like feeling of angst and anxiety and that we share. Like during the pandemic, it was one thing and, mm -hmm. and now it's on to another. Yeah, we all carry heavy burdens. And uh, the name of this podcast is Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers and hosted by therapists. We have Hannah Cross joining us today, one of our faves and a therapist. Yeah. Um, and so I thought, we thought when we were discussing what we might talk about today, that it might be useful for our audience, uh, many of which are helping professionals themselves or aspiring helping professionals or people who want to be helped by helping professionals with specific interests in psychedelic medicine. Um, thought we might share our own journeys with help um, you know, the, uh, as a therapist, I've received a ton of therapeutic help. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, the helping professionals are with you guys. We're, we're all together in this sort of collective heavy weight. We're all just walking each other home. As the saying goes. Should we reveal how we came up with the topic in what ceremonial context? Sure. Yeah. Um, I thought that was, uh, a fun idea that just emerged from the universe, from the quantum field. Mm. Um, I um, love me a good quantum field. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, because we were talking about how we don't want to just do a boring topic and what should we actually talk about. And uh, we were also talking about, wouldn't it be fun to do some hape? <laughs> and, uh, and then we were talking about intentions of hape and how we each use it. And then we decided to do a, a hape experience together mm -hmm. with an intention. The intention being, it was uh, something like, "What does our audience, what does need, our from audience need from us?" Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, some of you need this because that's the download we got. <laughs> well, will you um, share what came to you after hape, Steve, related to this? What oh, wow. do they need? They need these more. invitations to be vulnerable. Uh, yeah. So the thought that I immediately had, as my my nasal passages were on fire and my body was buzzing, <laughs> was um, that the audience needs. This is going to sound conceited, but it's not. If I can explain it, they need Steve. They need more of me. Mm -hmm. um, and. What what that meant to me is that one of the one of the things I really mm -hmm. value about podcasts in general that are done well is the intimacy. It's yeah. the 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 peek behind the the well curated curtain that you get in a TED talk or a yeah. prepared lecture. That um, you get to see the humanity uh, in a podcast where the hosts, the, the the people conversing, are willing to be vulnerable. And I have derived so much benefit from podcasts like that where I get to see the humanity mm -hmm. of the people that I either look mm -hmm. up to or I'm interested in or want to learn from. So yeah, that's kind of the, the download. Well, and that personal kind of exploration of therapy is the best way to learn how to do therapy. I think I supervise a number of like budding therapists or student interns and they always kind of have this question that comes up in supervision, like how do I learn to do therapy and what therapy modalities mm -hmm. do I dive into? And pretty consistently, I think my answer is go sit on the couch mm -hmm. yeah. side of the therapist room and, and try some different therapies out. And that's how, A, you'll learn how to do it, but B, learn what you feel like works. Mm -hmm. That's been the best training for me as a therapist is to go get the therapy because I'm a pretty good mimic. And if if people are, if I have a therapist with a very particular approach, we'll talk about many today, doing that approach to me, I learn 10 times as fast how to mm -hmm. do that approach as a therapist um, compared mm -hmm. to, you know, some kind of course that I take or specific supervised training. Do you ever feel like sometimes you in the therapy room as a therapist, you kind of channel some of your mentors oh, yeah. over yeah. the years yeah. and not in this insincere way, but you can just almost like see them coming through yeah. you. And it's kind of fun in that way to think about the lineage of therapy. Mm -hmm. oh, I you love know, that. I just had a thought that, that that's also one of the reasons why in training programs where we're training psychedelic assisted therapists, that we there's often a discussion about whether or not such therapists ought to have their own experience with altered states. 
So mm -hmm. Reed mentioned we were training therapists this morning on how to do ketamine assisted psychotherapy. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's one of the things we address with our new clinicians. Mm -hmm. Should you have your own experience with ketamine or another altered state? And that's uh, maybe a debate for another day, yeah. but should you have your own experience with therapy? I love what Hannah just said, because you learn therapy by getting therapy, mm -hmm. <laughs> by getting on the couch, getting vulnerable, like not just watching it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's so much to being a therapist that's about kind of just understanding how the mind works mm -hmm. and being able to map out the influences of the subconscious mind on behaviors and thoughts. And mm -hmm. I think the only way that you can really come to understand how to map it out is if you've mapped out your own mm -hmm. and have tried to explore the different regions of your own psyche so you can see what's happening in your clients. Exactly. So you can see what's happening. It's hard to spot what's happening, especially if it's subtle. Yeah. If you haven't experienced some of that yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that, I think especially working with um, psychedelics, because there's all of this unconscious material that's coming up. And mm -hmm. if you haven't really looked at similar um, themes in your own mind, it's it's difficult to know how to work with it as it comes up. And that's not to say that um, in order to help somebody, you have to know exactly what they're going through. I, I enunciated that oh, yeah. word really weird. but. Uh, exactly what they're going through. Um, I don't think that's the case, but I think you, you, it, it would be really useful for you to at least know what it's like to plumb the depths of your own psyche, to, oh, yeah. to be vulnerable, to open up to some, to a professional helper, to go to some of those places. Like we've quoted before, one of the great maps trainers, Marcella Odolora, you can only take someone as deep as you've gone yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think sometimes people misinterpret what she, not that I know exactly what she yeah. means, but, uh, deep, go deep, deep in yourself. Depth. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, do, it just, it just, it, again, do it, doesn't, work. it doesn't mean you have to do the exact same work that somebody else has done in right. order to be able to help them, but you have to know what depth is like. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think the deeper you go, the more you can understand, not exactly, but almost everything that does come up in your clients because, and this is just Hannah's opinion, but the longer that I've done therapy and explored my own mind, the more and more I start to think we are really all the same. Like we really, yeah. we all have the same kind of archetypes somewhere inside of us, mm -hmm. um, similar dynamics, similar themes of negative beliefs. I mean, who doesn't have this kind of loneliness at least some point in, at oh, some yeah. point in their life to heal and feeling like a bad person. And we really are kind mm -hmm. of the same. The, that energizes me a lot in therapy and even when talking to friends or like if someone asks for advice, I love it when it hits a, a button of, oh, I've been through yeah, that. I've, been, I've there. been there. I know a little bit about what it's like. I know I don't know exactly what mm -hmm. it's like to be you, but, but I have gone through a similar challenge and came out on the other side and I would love to just share my perspective on what worked for me or give you some tips. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of thing prompts an eagerness and a willingness to be present with and a compassion and empathy in a therapist that I, I think is palpable and the client can tell or the friend can tell, as opposed to sort of an academic understanding of what they might be going through. And, mm -hmm. and a confidence and a belief, like mm. you, even if it's not conveyed in words, like I know I made it through to the other side of that. Mm -hmm. I know you can too. Let's do this. Yeah, yeah. To be able to convey that message, this is healable with sincere yeah. confidence goes such a long way. The storm will pass. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rita, bookmarked in my mind that we mentioned our hape ceremony. Perhaps we should tell people <laughs> who don't know what it is, what it is. Hape, uh, which you could, if you want to look it up, it's H-A-P-E with an accent or rape, R-A-P-E with an accent. And it's... Uh, um, from the jungle, uh, from the indigenous people of the Amazon and other areas, um, a combination of plants that you might hear called like sacred snuff, for example. But uh, it's been used for ages, um, traditionally, ceremonially, um, for a variety of reasons, like some indigenous peoples would use it before uh, going to bed at night to have vivid dreams about where they should hunt in the morning. Then they get up and they do a different blend of plants, uh, often with the common thread of mapacho, not always, and other plants. Um, and in the morning, they might take one that helps them be energized and have extra clear perception 
for the hunt. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, since then, it's been used ceremonially, tied to uh, ayahuasca ceremonies often these days. Um, yeah, what would you add to the hape background? I mean, I, I think you summarized it. Yeah, how do... You how does one use it now? Is this a different podcast topic or mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe a hoppe episode? Yeah, we're going to stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that is needed because it's becoming more and more um, talked about and explored by people mm -hmm. as the psychedelic renaissance uh, yeah. really um, takes off. And as more mm -hmm. and more people learn about these things they're encountering yeah. hape mm -hmm. um, and other similar things like cacao ceremonies or kana ceremonies these things that are mm -hmm. legal in most places yeah and don't typically trigger the same altered states that lsd or psilocybin might but mm -hmm. um, are used ceremonially and to yeah. describe it like just to use my first hape experience as an example i was working um you know as a therapist and medical support in an ayahuasca retreat setting in the jungle and my co-therapist uh, after i think after the first no it wasn't after the first dosing session after the first day of like prep uh we had all worked so hard put our ourselves into this uh, process we were debriefing after and then he said uh would anyone like a hape experience and mm. uh i was like i don't even really know what that is but yes please <laughs> and then um, many others were part of this circle where there's a powder, a combination of plants, and you put it on a device like a um, caripe or a tepi, for example, one that's self-administered or one that's administered to another. These are basically uh, tubes you blow it through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like it could be like a monkey bone mm -hmm. with uh, some different uh, woods or crystals on it or different... Uh, uh, traditional devices, but basically it's something that the shaman or the administrator or your your friend would administer the hape through by blowing it into your nose, uh, you know, in this ceremonial sacred exchange with intention. Mm -hmm. And then what happens, um, say you're doing it on one side, then the other, which is um, how it's often done. Sometimes it's done both at the same time, but there's a sensation, a tingling sensation on that one side typically, mm -hmm. and a grounding, a sense of grounding, and for me, a sense of grounded and um, elevated, expanded, like opening up um, to the present moment, but firmly rooted in it. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And it depends on the blend. Yeah, because yeah, they mix it with different plants. Yeah, my first hoppe experience was pretty neat in a Wachuma ceremony, and mm. with my um, first first time using it, I, it took me to this like cliffside in Ireland, just really enhanced the experience, but also I felt so wow. safe and grounded. And second, um, I guess, hit of hoppe, and I was like in this Viking experience, which was really cool. It opened mm. up this kind of ancestral experience because that is my ancestry, both Irish and um, some Nordic. kind of Scandinavian. Yeah. It was pretty neat. But out, outside of a plant, um, medicine ceremony. I mean, we've used it with whatever intentions. Yeah. Like, is there a fear that's coming up that wants to be dissolved? Um, are we just trying to reset from kind of the busyness of a crazy clinical day? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a tool. And, yep. um, you know, we wanted to talk about other therapeutic tools that we've benefited from in our own lives personally that have allowed us to be sharp tools in the toolbox for other people, for our clients. Mm -hmm. So shall we? Should yeah, the tool's a, a good point because I think that tool, like many others, clears out the debris, makes mm -hmm. space for yourself to shine through, your soul to speak, your intentions to come alive, like we were talking about with this podcast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, shout out um, of gratitude for being a therapist because mm -hmm. naturally walking this path, you collect tools along the way. And I'm just so thankful that I have tools to reset or process difficult emotions and they don't have to necessarily linger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I forget cause I, I spend all day practically every day in the world of mental health. And then I'll go talk to like my brother who's an engineer and, uh, you know, he's almost never thought, thinking about this, mm -hmm. right? He's like, man, I got really angry the other day. And I'm like, do you want to talk about it? Like, no, <laughs> why would I do that? <laughs> like, <laughs> Hell no. Hell no. <laughs> I don't talk about it. I just break things. Could we explore that? Oh, yeah. yeah. Have you have you been meditating at all? Like, no, what the heck? That's what weirdos yeah. do. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a really good acknowledgement. And the other thing you mentioned about acknowledging mentors and teachers, I mm-hmm. really like. I think it's worth, yeah, giving a big shout out to all of those who have paved the way and um, like put these tools out there for us to draw from the therapy modalities that they dedicated their lives and careers Mm -hmm. and passions to that Mm -hmm. we can now use and help people with. Yeah, we stand on the shoulders of giants. Yeah, Mm -hmm. absolutely. So who are some of the giants that uh, (laughs) we think we stand on the shoulders of? Um, Carl Rogers is one for me, and Abraham Maslow is another. Like some of the uh, the originators of modern psychology um, and Carl psychotherapy. Jung. Carl, Carl Jung. Carl Jung. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and these are all around the same time. You know, it's really interesting. I think the term came from mid 1800s, right? But then, fast forward until uh, so late 1800s, you had Freud, Jung, Adler. Freud, Adler, Jung. But then in the 1960s, there were like a hundred therapies that were born. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just like, well, it probably has something to do with the the uh, psychedelic um, renaissance of that age. Right. Yeah. Just the changing, if I can use an obnoxious word, zeitgeist of the time. Oh, yeah. But um, uh, people turning inward and reflecting. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. before then, you know, it was a lot of stigma around around mental health care. It was the insane asylum. You were loony or nutty or crazy. Um, you were dangerous, you know, there was something mm-hmm. wrong with you. So much so that people returning from the first world wars were, uh, we didn't even have a term for what they were going through. It was shell shock or yeah. combat fatigue. Um, and a lot of these folks developed problems with substances or, uh, became homeless or were put in basically, uh, concentration camps for the mentally ill. So transforming mm-hmm. ideas and thoughts around how the mental space goes wrong, I think maybe accounts for a little bit about this explosion in psychotherapy and under, also understanding of the human mind. Yeah. It's amazing to look back at, to see like Freud gets uh, criticized these days for his focus on like, uh, you know, the sexual issues of childhood and, you know, the, the relationship of uh, the mother figure and everything and others, but then, and sure, folks like Jung learned so much from him and then branched off, but it was this building on the shoulders of giants Mm -hmm. that happened. And then like Carl Rogers, like bringing humanistic Mm -hmm. therapy into the world, it's like taking it a huge step forward and then another huge step forward, Maslow and others. Right, Stan Groff, and then you had the behaviorists. Skinner. Skinner, Bandura, Um, and then the cognitive behaviorists like Beck, Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and Ellis, Albert Ellis, R-E- of REBT. Marsha Linehan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. like DBT. DBT. Think about how many lives DBT has saved. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, especially a therapy for a, for a category of individuals that a lot of helping professionals had sort of avoided and written off. Those exactly. with, with uh, so-called borderline personality disorder, and, mm-hmm. uh, cluster B personality issues. And then you have the more modern therapies like acceptance and commitment therapy of Steve Hayes. Which has far reaching implications. Like the Yale manual of psilocybin assisted psychotherapy is built on ACT, mm-hmm. right? And DBT and ACT are great examples of the early therapies, at least that I'm aware of, that sort of combined mm-hmm. this stoicism informed cognitive behavioral approach with the Eastern informed mindfulness approach, mm-hmm. bringing both of those ideologies to, to psychotherapy. It's one of the things that drew me to act so much in uh, in graduate school. I really liked sort of client-centered Rogerian ideas, trusting the inner healer, unconditional positive regard, um, you know, uh, trusting that people would move toward wellness if given the right therapeutic relationship. And then combining that with some of the strategies of REBT and CBT. Um, but yeah, the mindfulness approach, the, mi- the addition of mindfulness was huge for my development as a therapist. Mm-hmm. What we call the third wave. Like right. if the, the first wave is strict behavioral. Psychoanalysis or behavioral. Behavioral. Or? Then the second would be layer on the cognitive. The mm-hmm. third, uh, bringing in mindfulness and acceptance into the equation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, as I was kind of briefly prepping for this, writing down all of the modalities that I use in the therapy room, like what do these have in common? And mindfulness is absolutely at core of all of them. And then the other component, too, is that they're all more 
like I hesitate to word, use the word experiential because a lot of times that's associated with like music and art therapy, but they all facilitate like a lived corrective experience in the therapy room mm -hmm. as opposed to just talking, like thinking oh, yeah. about problems, trying to think our way out of problems like that. Not really shown to work. Like we want to create new experiences mm -hmm. that are healing. Yeah. Moving beyond the talking cure or talk therapy, which I, I quite like, I'm, I'm, I, it comes naturally to me, just conversations with people where I ask them questions or reflect back to them in a way where it makes them think differently. And I've learned as I've experienced many different therapies over the course of my career so far, what you're talking about, Hannah, like the importance of a lived experience yeah. of difference, mm -hmm. how much more effective that can be for people. And in parallel with that, you have the somatic therapies these days that have uh, taken Tr healing from trauma to a new place in terms of what's possible, like engaging the body and not getting caught up in the labyrinths of the mind that can be tricky. It's hard to get um, unstuck or change the mind from within the mind that's stuck. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. I have a fun little story around so, like a somatic therapy. I went to go see a somatic therapist who's not a licensed therapist, but she does some body work and different somatic release type practices as well as this like hypnosis which is really cool mm. that maybe I'll talk about too but um, I remember telling her what I wanted to work on I told her these kind of patterns that I had noticed in myself that I wanted to change and then I said well maybe next time we can work on this part of it and she kind of stopped me and this was a huge turning point for me and goes no we're gonna take care of it all today in mm. this experience today I just want to set that container mm. that we can do this and sure enough that worked and that was a huge takeaway for me that, okay, especially if we're using these experiential therapies where um, my clients are really in their bodies in the moment, um, we can, we can take care of this stuff like now. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, yeah. doesn't it need to involve a bunch of conversations over a whole year of you seeing me weekly. That's a key feature maybe to point out about, uh, when looking for a therapist or just the benefit of having a therapist is someone who's, like we said, gone through it before, knows what's possible, even though you don't, and can call you out on it or take you by the hand in a good way. Say, no, we're doing this. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you need to feel like you can trust your therapist. And a lot of that trust is developed because you perceive them to be competent, to be able to hold you in safe space. Um, mm -hmm. and to have the approach that you feel like matches the problem that you have. And it's often difficult to know because we're going in there, you know, most of the time, not really knowing at all what we need. We just need something. Yeah. But I think those are important ingredients if it, for, to help you know whether or not you've chosen the right person or how to look for the right person mm -hmm. to help you. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I actually typically recommend therapist shopping to my mm -hmm. clients that first come in. And how how would one go about that? You know, this is interesting because I maybe you could support me with this, but um, I typically say to get to or sit with a few therapists and really just listen to your intuition on mm -hmm. the right one. Like yeah. I know my personal journey of, of therapy was that I'd tried a few therapists and kind of like stuck with some probably past the expiration date. Like we just weren't progressing. Mm -hmm. And the therapist that I've worked with probably the longest, but also like in the most kind of in-depth way, the moment I met her, I was like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes than like an embodied sense or an intuitive knowing or a spark. And it's not always offered. Uh, like you can read up on people on Psychology Today and mm -hmm. if they have any videos, watch them, of course. But I do love it when a therapist does offer like a brief call to explore if you're a good fit first. Even though I know we, we don't offer that here um, as a general rule because it's not like, it's hard to put that into the um, the regular mental health system, but um, maybe we can explore more of how to do that. But you can still try out um, with an openness about it, try out the goodness of mutual fit um, going into that first session or first few. No mm. problem. Yeah. There are a lot of other variables that we grapple with, like um, whether or not you're in, if you're going to pay with insurance, whether or not your insurance covers this particular therapist. So yeah, or, that guides many people to understandably yeah. because it can be really expensive. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, I like, I like the way you two are talking about this, this intuition. Like sometimes you just know. And uh, mm-hmm. also there, there can be seasons and chapters, mm-hmm. right? You don't, once you find somebody that you like, it's not like that has to be your therapist for the next 30 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you finish your work with somebody. I like, in addition to therapist shopping, I like therapist hopping or therapist <laughs> yeah, surfing. Yeah, therapist hopping. Like, and not in a way that, like, I like to do a course with a therapist and uh, give it a good try and then try another one, another thing for my own learning and for my own progress. But like I just yeah. did with the most recent one was a course of IFS with an, a well-trained IFS therapist, mm-hmm. which was amazing. Yeah. I had a really interesting experience with the last IFS therapist that I saw. So Reed and I saw IFS therapists around the same time, um, both interested in that modality. And I just wanted to, I wanted some help for with mm-hmm. my shit, but I also wanted to experience the modality. Yeah. So I found somebody locally who was certified on the website, right? To IFS and had really, really good experience with this person. And then, um, mm-hmm. you know, I did it for about a year, maybe a little under a year and stopped and then after a while, felt like I, I kind of wanted to go back. There were some some things I wanted to to continue to explore. So I contacted her, and she said no. She said I don't think you need this. I think your your efforts to learn this right now, in addition to getting help by it, are encumbering your progress. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I don't know about this part. I'm still thinking about this part. But it was basically like I don't think you're sick enough for this. Um, which I didn't super love, but it forced me to reflect. What about, yeah. why was I really going back to mm-hmm. her? And it eventually led me to seek out a very different kind of help. And that is coaching. So I've been playing around in this coaching world for a while now. There's a difference between psychotherapy and coaching. Uh, not the least of which is psychotherapy can only be provided by a licensed psychotherapist. If you want to be really nitpicky and annoying about those terms, Mm -hmm. the term psychotherapist, certainly the term psychologist and psychiatrist are protected terms in the United States. Not everyone can just call themselves a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a psychotherapist. You have to have a license, but anybody can call themselves a coach. So the uh, expertise and the quality of a coach can vary wildly. And there are coaches who are sort of generalists, like quote unquote life coaches. And then there are coaches who have specific audiences or approaches. There's performance coaching, executive coaching. Um, there's uh, business coaching, things like that. So uh, right now I'm seeing a coach and it has been really, really interesting because I've seen so many therapists. I've had this psychotherapy relationship. This coaching relationship is very different. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, it's a lot more challenging uh, he challenges me to act, to do certain behavioral experiments that I don't I haven't really gotten those similar challenges from the therapists I've seen. I've had homework before, of course, but not challenges in the way that he's offering to, them to me. So, uh, lots of different places you can get help, folks. Would you say, Steve, that coaching is maybe a little more focused on like how you want to show up in the world now, regardless of like what kind of trauma is unresolved? Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's the distinction I've. Um, I've heard made by a lot of people in the industry between coaching and therapy is that therapy tends to be uh, about healing. It tends to be about plumbing the past for the traumas or the things that have, the relationships that have happened that have led to your current issues. Whereas coaching is more about what are your, what is your aspirational identity? What are you trying to create and lead in life? And let's come up with a plan to get you there. Mm-hmm. With a lot of overlap, like you Tons. could go see yeah. a therapist for that. There are you know, performance psychologists, sports mm-hmm. psychologists, and there are great coaches in that regard. Too. I do plenty mm-hmm. of coaching yeah. with my therapy Same. clients. I kind of bounce yeah. back and forth with my clients between this focus on the here and now and showing up the way that you want to, regardless of what feels unresolved or not. Mm-hmm. And then when it feels appropriate or when the psyche is asking for the healing work, because it will, like it will ask you through dreams or it will ask you mm-hmm. through these big reactions that you're having to kind of go look at some of the shadow stuff um, and do that kind of therapy. But mm-hmm. I think it's important to have a balance between the the two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There was another thought I had about coaching and then it just totally left my mind. Uh, oh, psychedelic, <laughs> psychedelic coaching. Mm-hmm. So you, if, if you Google it, folks, you'll, you'll find there are a lot of people who are offering coaching around the use of psychedelics. 
and proceed with caution. I mean, you should proceed with caution mm-hmm. with, with any time yeah. you're, ask, you're asking for help. But um, there are people who are coaching around integration or preparation or microdosing coaching. Um, you know, second to, the ones that are still not legal to be prescribed, you know, just be cautious about coaches who are offering illegal help uh, or help in illegal realms. But yeah, there are also a lot of really good competent coaches out there around psychedelic use. Um, our therapy journeys. Mm-hmm. Maybe what what else have you all explored? I was writing down my list. So my supervisors in graduate school, I had I had a nice sampling of different approaches. I had somebody who was very client centered Rogerian. Mm-hmm. I had somebody who was sort of gestalt, um, very heavily influenced by Irving Yalom, uh, very existential. Um, then I had somebody who was a psychoanal a psychoanalyst, and then I had somebody who was uh, CBT, mm-hmm. and then ACT. So again, a good sample, but the therapist I've been to, the first one I ever went to was REBT. He was like a disciple of Albert Ellis. Hmm. And um, I found it really, really helpful. <laughs> like, yeah. Because yeah. I, I, I tend to be up in my head. And so, you know, I was solving some of the problems of my head at the level of my head with those cognitive behavioral approaches. But I definitely hit a wall with that and uh, have since benefited a lot from ACT, from emotion focused therapy, IFS, and have yet to explore somatic therapies Mm -hmm. for myself. Although it seems like you've been exploring it in other ways, similar to the coaching, but like when you went to your first yoga class Mm -hmm. that we talked about in here, there's uh, a great somatic therapy or Mm -hmm. embodiment practice. yeah, I've been I've been through on this funny journey of coming home to my body. Yeah. Because I was yeah. I was very kinesthetic as a kid. I was an athlete. I loved stretching. I loved martial arts. I loved mm-hmm. dancing around. And then became very academic and up in my my brain space uh, when I went to college and have gotten away from my body. And it shows I'm so stiff and like <laughs> immobile and, and not in tune. So But there is a part of you that just loves to dance. We there saw is. it for a second after our hoppe ceremony. I was over doing here. a little spontaneous dancing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's <laughs> yeah. I, I gotta get to know him because uh I think you are. I like him when, oh, yeah. when I see him. Yeah, 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 I do. And psychedelic therapies in general have a big focus on the body. Yeah. Like it's, there's a somatic uh component woven through and mm-hmm. um and more and more like all the, the trauma therapies like we were talking about but but i think uh well they all have a part of the puzzle right the strictly cognitive and the strictly body focused and the emotion focused the one you know the values there are different change mechanisms that people like to focus on like exposure therapies and uh corrective experiences but the thing is in my opinion there all these are happening in parallel and they can all mm-hmm. be leveraged and uh it's kind of an impossible task to just say you um should do this therapy approach or this therapy only mm-hmm. and that's the absolute only path for you because i think there are lots of paths up this mountain mm-hmm. of healing and growth yeah and as a therapist there are a lot of paths and it really isn't Therapy is so much an art yeah. where, you know, I'm like thinking about it. What do I do in the therapy room? And <laughs> I would say that I do EMDR and IFS, but enter both of those interventions through the body. And a mm. lot of times it's like mm-hmm. we're doing parts work with some bilateral stimulation. That's like the piece I pull from EMDR. Mm-hmm. And there's always this return to the body and accessing parts, emotions, um, through the body. Yeah. Um, so that's and, kind of where I've arrived. And even earlier today, after our training, you mentioned, oh, I brought in some Hakomi into that one. Like there, that's the beauty of it. You can have all these like tools in your toolkit and then bring them out mm-hmm. um, based on that experience, intuition as a therapist and you know, your own therapy journey. Your own therapy journey. And the signposts you see, the, the clues you see in clients along the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think this is a good testament to why you would want to go to a professional helper in the first place. Like what makes what we can do for people worthy of having a career doing it, worthy of accepting Mm -hmm. the exchange of money for doing it. Um, Part of it's our, like any discipline, we've committed a lot of time Mm -hmm. and submitted ourselves to the instruction of a lot of wise people and studied and practiced. Um, But it doesn't mean that we are... 
disciples of any one particular kind of approach. I really liked the way you were describing your approach, Hannah, because it was, you have, have enough experience and education and enough dedication to this work that you can have, like Reed said, a tool bag that your use of those tools is informed by a coherent theory of mind, a coherent theory of the, of human consciousness, of how it could develops pain and how you can help a person transcend that pain or heal from that pain. And that's what's a little different about just like talking to your mom or to oh. a well-meaning friend, which can be tremendous. And some those people can sometimes do way more than we can. But uh, we arguably can do some things that they can't be just by dint of that education and that commitment to the, the discipline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a different... Uh... It's a different thing to have a conversation with a loved one than to go into this intentional space mm -hmm. of a client and therapist where therapists put in thousands of hours. Um, and if they haven't, they have supervision for someone who has thousands of hours mm -hmm. right there. And then, you know, with the goal of, like Hannah pointed out, having those, that container where stuff can come up and you can work through it using these tried and tested tools. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah. the relationship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, and I don't want to, I don't want to overstate it. Like, um, there are some shitty therapists out there <laughs> Yeah, and there yeah. are therapists who are, uh, weighed down by their own demons and can, can hurt people mm -hmm. as a result. So, um, yeah, I don't want to make, give the impression that there's something, uh, godlike about it. And they don't always isn't. know what's right. If your therapist is just telling you what to do with your life, right. I mean, that's, probably a red flag right yeah. uh, but if there's that that safe container for and that trusting relationship for you to figure out um how to heal and grow and and you know really step into your real self then you know, i think you're on to something and it's a weird relationship right which is precisely why i think it works mm -hmm. because this is a relationship where i'm 100 percent here for this person most relationships are a little more reciprocal mm -hmm. back and forth, which is why if your therapist talks about themselves during your session a lot and doing, does most of the talking, another red flag perhaps, because this really should be all about you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pretty, it's, uh, pretty rare that we have that kind of relationship, right? Where it is mostly about us. And some therapy approaches are the opposite, like, like psychodynamic ones, especially psychoanalysis, mm -hmm. where the therapist traditionally supposed to be the blank slate and just sit there. You might be laying on a couch. They might be out of sight and uh, just like writing things down and saying, right. uh, hmm, mm. as you uh, just spill the contents of your psyche. Yeah. So Reed, I opened my kimono. It is now your turn. What, uh, mm. what therapy paths have you benefited from? I actually started my first ever um, course of therapy while in training was with a psychodynamic psychotherapist and, um, and it was really fascinating, like intimidating in a way, um, to have have someone somewhat of like a blank slate or older there. Um, and but it was extremely um, profound to like explore some of those deep um, early life things that might cause us some um, maladaptive patterns in the here and now, just looking for the roots of some of uh, our behaviors. Um, but uh, what was fascinating to me through that, and even in my most recent course of therapy that I was talking about, IFS, is how um, even now at this stage of my career, I was, I remember getting ready to tell my therapist most recently that I felt like I was ready to be done, kind of the opposite of yours. I was about to um, say, I'm feeling good, but I started having hesitation, like, I don't want to disappoint them. I don't want, mm. like, like I could feel the old parts um, pulling towards a default or old way of just, like, they're going to tell you what to do instead of, like, no, I know this feels right to me, or at least I'm going to bring it up for discussion. Um, so, yeah, I love that safe container to explore those things that and get the buttons pushed. We don't always get pushed, you know. So, any, any other that you've really benefited know. from? Yeah, all, I mean, there's a big alphabet soup of them, um, including a lot of, uh, a lot of somatic ones, but, uh, one that stands out was a course of hypnotherapy from a really 
like a really skilled, maybe gifted therapist who I saw online during the pandemic who practice a lot of like hypnotherapy and a lot of uh, more of the quantum. There's nothing quantum on their bio, mm. but uh, more of the energetic components of uh, really believing that everything can be healed and cleared in the here and now. We're just going to shine a light on it. We're going to scour the shadows and we're going to bring it up and we're going to dissolve it. Bam, bam, bam. It's done. And then like at the end of those sessions, we do these dip, deep hypnotherapy sessions for a couple hours. And at the end, she'd be like, okay, now your homework, all your homework is, is to go like draw a bath with bath salts and soak in it and come back to planet Earth and let all this sink in. Hmm. Do you, how do you feel about the aftermath? Do you feel like it was beneficial? I do, I do. Um, yeah, I, for both uh, me personally at the time, it was, I haven't had a bad course of therapy. Mm -hmm. Like, And um, I do just trust the process. Like that was exactly what I needed at the time. Just like this parts work. There's some serendipity to it like that I can't explain, but I don't feel the need to of just like, um, as long as you're willing to do the work and as long as you respond to the call, um, you know, there's not really a wrong answer to um, listening to yourself every step of the way. Make sure you're with the right, like your, your body's saying, yes, see this coach or this therapist where you're heading towards. Um, you know, it's, it's an amazing journey. Mm. How about you, Hannah? Any other therapies that you've really benefited from? You know what that you I was wanna... thinking about that I really benefited from, but I don't really use a whole lot of in my own therapy practice. My first counselor was a substance abuse counselor that was like, break you down mm. from this place of love type approach. Like, yeah. I remember one time I was kind of like covering my mouth and group and he's he goes why are you covering your mouth hannah you know mm -hmm. we're like a hokomi therapist practicing hokomi i might say i noticed that your hand is kind of up can you just keep it there and be really curious about what that's about you know it was like mm. why are you doing that <laughs> you know yeah. but he just Push had this really hard uh, like approach that really like bruised the ego which was kind of the point mm. i think but mm. um helped me so much and then I did this large group awareness training that kind of had a similar approach of, I guess I want to call it this break you down to build you up, like a masculine shaved head coach, essentially, that facilitated these large group processes that were really, really difficult and humbling, but um, so beneficial. Like the mm -hmm. aftermath of that was just so much openness and like release of what wasn't working for me, you know? I don't really take that approach myself as a therapist, but it was really beneficial in earlier stages of the journey. And then EMDR therapy. I mean, mm. I've done a ton of my own EMDR therapy. I still will go to it if I feel like I need some movement on something and mm. um, found so much benefit in that. I mean, EMDR therapy taught me how to grieve, taught me how to forgive, mm taught me how to feel feelings that I like had shoved so deep I didn't even know they were there like feelings of violation and loneliness so I'm a I'm a huge EMDR fan mm. um, so those were really I think my therapy experiences but as we've been talking I've also been thinking about the therapies that have been so crucial that aren't actually like formal mm -hmm. therapies like yoga different shamanic practices like trance dance. I mean, trance dance for me a lot of times is like 10 hours of therapy in one, one session. Mm. I mean, you can really do inner child work and then have this transcendent experience. And it's really amazing, kind of like we know with psychedelic work too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a Course of Miracles, I mean, that's self-therapy. You're undoing beliefs mm -hmm. that serve as barriers to love by walking through 365 lessons, one a day. Um, that's therapy, but you know, you're doing it with the Holy Spirit, I guess, and yourself. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's been my journey. That reminds me of one of the most profound courses of therapy for me was when I was training in emotion-focused therapy um, from Les Greenberg and colleagues who created it, but just having to go through my own course of it and not only reconnect with my emotions, but experience chair work 
and then do chair work, which mm-hmm. was something I never thought I'd do. Like um, for the first decade of my career, I just thought I'm not a chair work person. Mm-hmm. I don't, just like you were saying, I'm not going to shave my head and push someone's buttons um, with uh, a certain style, but it was really neat to g- have to go through that um, and realize actually that comes in handy. Like, um, and I can uh, I can apply my own style to it um, that feels completely right and comfortable and um, and works for me. I'm not a chair work person. That's uh, so interesting the way we sort of create yeah. identities for ourselves around things like this. Like I, for for a long time, I thought I wasn't a body work <laughs> person. Yeah, I was I was a cerebral guy. You know, my parents are academics. We my my brothers are engineers and lawyers. We we use our brains. And um, my journey as of late, as I've re- uh, made reference to, has just been so weird, <laughs> mm-hmm. but so delightful to discover that I am a body person. Like I love moving my body. I love using my body. There's so much to learn yeah. in my body if I pay attention to it. And it's where I have uh, lately have felt the most at home and the most free is when my body feels at home and free. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, fr- I just... Yep. When I check in, I realize how tight I've been, how how much I've been holding on to things in my body. I don't know why. I don't know why I've been so resistant to this idea that we are a body brain, that we aren't just you know a meat puppet that carries around this supercomputer in our in our skull. Um, there's so much more to us. And my rea- we joke around about my reaction to like the quantum and about astral projection mm-hmm. and stuff. And a lot of those just it's wrapped up around my identity as a Western trained social scientists that Evidence I pay attention based. to the data. Yeah. yeah. And I don't buy into this woo woo bullshit, but I'm, I'm also discovering as I play around at the fringes that there's so much truth and so many limitations to the way that we approach mm-hmm. truth gathering. So anyway, that was yeah. a vomit of a lot of things. That was a good vomit though. I love, I love a good yeah. vomit. We're all body people. We just forget. Yeah, I mean, totally. but there's a lot of reasons You're like, I don't know why, but I can think of a lot of reasons why, the majority of us have to do that journey back home to our bodies. You know, it's, mm-hmm. we avoid it because of pain. We avoid it because in this like Western Judaism approach, it's like the body is this thing to be transcended. It is yeah. the source of sin. Right. Get away from it. Um, where there's traditions that were historically more esoteric that say, no, like the body direct experience of life and the pleasure and the pain of it through the body mm-hmm. is the way to transcendence. Yeah, you know what brought me back to the body? It was like Buddhist practices and psychotherapies um, that led into the yogic approaches that led into, from there, even a complete shift in my career where I started working with eating disorders um, and diving into this like returning home to the body journey. Mm. There was one uh, mentor and uh, kind of researcher, psychotherapist I admire in the eating disorder world. There are many, but one named Neva Piran. She wrote a book, it's on my shelf over there, called Journeys of Embodiment, and, uh, and had this analogy of a corset. This is directed towards uh, kind of women with eating disorders, but this analogy of a corset that's placed on us by society that constricts us, tightens us, that kind of disconnects us from the joys of life, like one's um, joyful movement, dancing, um, expressing emotion, like uh, like especially in the sexist world that we that we live in, mm-hmm. um, and how like girls or women shouldn't display this emotion or that emotion. But then her approach to returning the body is taking each of those categories, like one's desire and connection to like one's sexual self and uh, um, the appreciation of food and the movement of your body, unhooking the corset one at a time as you come back to yourself so you can actually experience life to its fullness again like we did when we were kids. Yeah. I like that metaphor. Let's rip the bodice of societal pressures. (laughs) Yeah. And be free. Because that's another another, uh, big force at play is the cultural ones like when we were talking about with emotions mm-hmm. like how we were you know more disconnected from emotions in our emotional lives uh decades ago than we are now yeah i'm actually kind of giggling at myself because i talked about how my en- my entrance into therapy was this like really hardcore intense like um 
reflective counseling. But now I'm realizing that my entrance to the body was also kind of that way too, because I started as a like a weightlifter. Mm -hmm. I was doing these national physique committee competitions. So it was like putting my body through the ringer, you know, mm -hmm. including this like finale of extreme dehydration before you go on stage. And then I had some friends and family friends and I'm, I love them so much for this. They said, Hannah, we think you would like Bikram yoga, this hot mm -hmm. yoga. It's really intense, you know, it'll suit you well. And I went and it kicked my ass the first couple of times. Yeah. I was like, I thought I was in shape. I'm dying. And um, that's what kept me going back. Like, that's just the kind of mindset that I had, you the know, challenge. was like, just yeah. go hard. Yeah. Um, but the result was that I was like forced to stay for 90 minutes at a time with myself, nowhere mm -hmm. to run, nowhere to hide, learning to breathe through discomfort and emotions and looking at myself in the mirror and like that was mm -hmm. that was such a, it was like this harsh but um kind of necessary i think for me and where i was at the time re-entry mm -hmm. into the body yeah we should take uh steve to a, a hot yoga class yeah. um, yes. for, the, for his next experience mm -hmm. those, those are intense you guys just want to humble me don't you <laughs> I kind of had a similar experience with my body growing up, you know, being a football player. And then everybody, like my buddies all wanted to be superhero buff, right? We, we, we wanted to be jacked. We wanted yeah. to beat our bodies into submission so we could make them into these well-oiled machines that would score touchdowns and, and give people concussions with our own skulls. And then, you know, I go, go to graduate school. I'm not, I'm not really an athlete anymore. And I sort of just let my body be. Mm -hmm. and um, have re been rediscovering exercise, but I find myself going back to my you know, 16, 17 year old's conception of what strong and buff and you know, physically capable is, but now I'm 39 and lifting weights hurts. Like my, all my joints hurt. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm pushing through pain in a way that's probably not super healthy. So I'm on a, I'm on a journey folks and Reed and mm -hmm. Hannah are gonna help me get there, but uh, getting back to my body and taking care of him. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fascinating that balance between effort and ease or mm -hmm. that, uh, that getting pushed the right amount, but not too much, mm -hmm. you know, by, and that, that is a sign of a good teacher or therapist yeah. or someone who will, who will really see your limitations, see what's possible and, and push you through it because same thing in the, in the yoga world, like my entry to yoga just happened to be Ashtanga, which is, like one of the more hardcore ones like Bikram where it's a, it's a discipline practice. In fact, the first series that you go through, we were talking about this earlier, is called Yoga Chikitsa, meaning yoga therapy. And they call it, um, and that's, that was self-therapy for me like nothing else for sure. Um, just uh, going in versus coming out, like a, a great uh, clearing and reset and, and opening um, but yeah, that's, um, I can list off a number of these things, but like meditation, yoga and psychedelic medicine, um, experiences and breath work, they've just been so like life changing, um, each in their own way. Like some of these courses of therapy were. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, we could talk about this forever. It feels like I want to thank both of you for being vulnerable with me today, for sharing with our audience what we think will be helpful. Anything else you wanna say as we wrap up? I could uh, read a quote to match your poem. It's from the Hakomi uh, textbooks. It's actually from the Purple Hakomi book. I forget what that one's called, um, but it's by someone named Sherry Greenwood. And it says, all I need to be well lives deeply within me. The healer who comes is a midwife who helps to birth my original self. It is from this place I am ready to be where I have never been before, able to know, maybe for the first time, the unbroken field. Love it. Speaks to that inner healer and inner healing intelligence and that that belief that I think we all share that trees grow towards the sunlight, a seed wants to be planted, you know, we get a wound, it knows how to heal. And, uh, and yeah, it is uh, definitely a worthwhile pursuit to seek out the therapists, coaches, mentors, teachers who can help us uh, 
clear the obstacles for this. Yeah, a yeah. midwife that helps us give birth to who we already are. Yeah. And it's, it's functioning all the time. Like even in our moments that we feel like are our darker moments, I would like to say that that is the inner healer attempting to birth you. It's just like the birth canal part. And so mm-hmm. if you can pay attention to what's coming up in those times and focus on it, give it attention, maybe take it to therapy. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's all it's all part of that healing process, even when it feels like we're going backwards. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, folks, go get help. Give help. <laughs> go give help. Thanks for listening. Thank you, dear listener, for listening. It means a lot to me. Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers is brought to you by Novamind, a mental health company that specializes in psychedelic medicine and research. You can learn more about Novamind's mission to increase access to legal, safe, and evidence-based psychedelic medicine at novamind.ca. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're using to listen or watch. Also, if you're feeling generous today, please leave us a glowing review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you like to listen. If you'd like to reach out to us with questions, suggestions, scathing criticisms, etc., please email us at psychfrontiers at novamind.ca. Thanks again. The content of this podcast does not constitute medical advice or mental health treatment. Please consult a medical or mental health professional if you believe you are in need of mental health treatment.